Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Aspire to Inspire podcast. My name is Brian Tomlinson and I am the head of content at Staffbase. And today I have with me Anna Mette Oud, a behavioral and communications expert and the owner of the Behavior Company. And welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you so much, Brian. I'm great. The weather is great. And you can call me Anne because on a march out, that is way too difficult. Yeah, uh, even even for me living in Germany, <laughs> it's 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 hard to to get it get it out, right? So yeah, yeah. appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, so let's get started. Jumping right into it. Um, what made you get into uh, behavioral science and um, into communication? Like, what was it that triggered you to go into that profession? I'm so super curious. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, well, what started it is that I did the Academy of Arts, uh, so performance art, as they would say, and that is focused on expression through verbal and physical behavior. So that was already the behavior part. But then I was asked to help some people to get knowledge about uh, stage presence. And I thought, doesn't everybody know this? This is common knowledge. Uh, but they didn't know it. And I was very fortunate to teach some people in businesses. And then I thought, okay, this is the path I want to go to. I don't want to be the director. I don't want to be the actor or the teacher mm -hmm. in that uh, field. But I really want to educate and help people within businesses to um, improve their behavior. So 20 years ago, I, I started the, more than 20 years ago, actually, I started the behavior company. And since then, well, I'm very fortunate to teach all over the world and to educate people on the behavior part. So that's, that's in short, the story. <laughs> the, the short one. No, but that, that sounds uh, super cool. I mean, what made you get into the arts? I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like uh, into to the performing arts. I, I, there was a teacher there uh, at my high school and she, there was kind of, you know, not regular classes, but you could take some classes to, uh, I don't know, to have fun after school. I guess that was the purpose. And she, she gave us um, workshops like improvisation theater and, and all those kind of things related to theater. And I never even thought about that as a possibility for a job or for studies. I was more thinking in the lines of, you know, becoming a teacher in the Dutch language or in the English language. Um, but when she showed me that that was a profession as well, uh, and um, I auditioned for the uh, Academy of Arts and I got in. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Yay. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Yeah. So so you, you took that shift and went into the business world. Yes. Uh, working with leaders and executives I'm, I'm guessing mostly what do you think are some of these key pillars um, for effective communication what what is it that leaders really need to do that's just the basics um, to, to really have good effective communication that mm -hmm. inspires people inspires their companies to go towards their that vision that they have well it's it's a broad question because what you see when people Firstly, it's great if they understand that behavior is an issue, that behavior has an effect on others. Um, so that would be the first start. The basis is to understand that it's not about just knowledge or goal-oriented businesses, but that we are in the, in the people business. We're working with people. So the fact that they, I think if they understand that behavior is a factor, then they can build from that. Like, who am I as a leader? What are my preferences? What is my style? And does it align with the people I'm leading or does it align with the business approach we have? And if they are willing to reflect on themselves and to really understand what the pros and cons are of their own behavior, like, is it effective what they're doing? Then I think um, that could be a great start to go to that good and effective communication that I hope leaders are, are striving for because sadly, I, and I understand it in a way because everybody, you know, everybody's busy and everybody has a focus on goals and it's difficult to, to focus on other things than business goals sometimes. But what a lot of people should understand, I think, is that you can help those business goals by improving your communication. 
Yeah, I think that's definitely true. That's something that we we certainly believe in mm-hmm. is that communication really helps to drive everything in the company. So just mm-hmm. clarity, culture, everything that a leader really needs to to show that empathetic side of themselves. Yeah, I know you 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 say that a lot of times though. Many leaders unfortunately don't have mm-hmm. that um, self awareness to know that they need to change their behavior or they, maybe they think their behavior is okay. Have, mm-hmm. have you come across situations like that? And, and how would you best approach um, a leader who needs to change in the right direction? Yes. Yeah, sometimes I come across people who are in a position where they almost do not get feedback anymore because they're yeah. the CEO and nobody dares to approach them in a way. So that's hard for them to reflect on their own behavior, like, how am I doing? Because everybody's saying, yes, it's great, it's fantastic, Um, which is not always the case, of course. But sadly, there's a hierarchy sometimes that prevents people from speaking up and giving feedback. So um, I would say it's important for leaders to understand, am I open for feedback? Do I ask for feedback? Do I get feedback? Um, but also to reflect on themselves to see what what could they improve. And if they want to improve, I think it starts with what kind of effect do you have on others? Or actually, it starts with focusing on yourself. Who are you and do you know your pitfalls and qualities? But also, mm-hmm. are you willing to look at the effect you have on others and really observe the behavior? Because what you see, if and I worked with some of those people who were in a position where nobody gave them feedback anymore. And when you start helping them by, because they're doing great, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's not a bad performance that, they, that they're putting on us, but there's this nuance that they, can, that they can use to help themselves to even improve more by observing others, by really focusing on the details of the, for instance, nonverbal communication of others so that they will see what the effect is and that they can build on that for instance working with their colleagues but also in negotiations like oh what can i tweak so to say yeah always looking for that little thing that little one percent where they can get better right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the the the, maybe sometimes it's the 0.001 but i think sometimes it it can be even i'm sometimes very I don't know if shocked is the right word, but very surprised that in some position, there are basic elements in communication that they do not show. So for instance, eye contact. I think that everybody knows now how important this this is. There's a lot of knowledge out there, but you still have to translate this into your behavior. You have to show it in your body. And um, not just eye contact, but also other things. I was working with them leader and he completely failed to focus on eye contact so he was always talking you know writing things down or looking at his phone and we we would say this is basic knowledge basic communication so it's not always the detailed details but the basic knowledge as well what would make up like the top three things uh, outside of eye contact we touched on that already Mm -hmm. what what else would you would you say would be really the basics that that leaders need to work on to have this effective communication that's that's necessary? I would say, apart from the eye contact, I think if we we take it a step further, it would be validation. the, the, The skill to validate others, to understand that they are in a different position, that they sometimes need to vent, that even if you don't have a lot of time, you still need to make time to understand what's going on in your business and to really validate the perspective of this other person. And um, when I work, for instance, with teams, this there's this common complaint, like I'm not, they don't notice me, they don't notice how hard we're working or they don't understand and they being the leaders um in many forms but that is that is something i if, if we if you say three things first eye contact the th- second one would be um validation and i think the third one if i ha- i have to choose right that would be observation to see okay. to really observe um and 
to observe yourself as well as the other person. Like, what am I doing? How am I today? What is my emotion? How does it reflect mm -hmm. on my behavior? All those kind of things. Yeah. And and if we change eye contact, then make it nonverbal communication. So we observe and we validate. Cool. I, I, actually, I actually really like that because I, I know you recently had a, held a talk with uh, a very provocative title. It was it's called The, the Road <laughs> to Hell is Paved with Bad Conversations. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Def definitely something that uh, was very eye-catching. But in that, I know you talked about building comfort. And um, when I think of that, that connects very much to this validation topic um, yes. in, in my eyes. So maybe we can we can switch a little bit. Um, first, maybe let us know what exactly the road to hell <laughs> looks like with bad <laughs> conversations, what you mean with that. Um, but then really dig into this validation topic and um, having comfort between both parties. Could, could you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more on that for me? Yes, of course. Um, well, it is a provocative title. I fully am. I'm aware of that. Um, but in essence, and we laugh about it, but in essence, there is, there is a truth to it, um, depending yeah. on how you want to phrase hell. But what I come across in organizations is, is heartache, is sorrow because of the lack of validation or the lack of conversation or the lack of communication. And what we see is if, if that starts to change within businesses, there's more comfort happening. There's more trust with teams amongst each other or towards the leaders. And it, it sounds very trivial. We have to have effective communication. We have to create comfort as leaders, but actually doing it is is difficult and if you do it the wrong way it affects many people and, and that's why i would consider it hell in the provocative title but it's um devastating sometimes that people you know when they confide in me and they share what has been going on um yeah you can you can see a lot of debris i would even say from the bad conversations that people have had and when you're referring to creating comfort, what I see is that when you have to have a difficult conversation, it is so more effective to focus on both parties. So if I'm, for instance, if I'm a leader and I have to have a difficult conversation, you sometimes see that they're very stressed or they're not bothered at all. That's also possible. But there's they have to understand there's an element of my comfort and that is affecting the other person as well. And what you see, and we've, I think we've all had that situation where sometimes somebody says, your, your manager says, hey, can you come over because I need to have a chat with you or you find an invite in your calendar, we have to have a chat. The yeah. stress level of people is very high immediately. And if you don't pick up on that as a leader and you're really focused on just content, like, hey, I have a message for you and you don't pick up on um, stress or you don't pick up on non-verbal so you don't pick up on all those other things yeah that's really a recipe for well maybe disaster we could even say disaster yeah yeah how do you make the time how do you find that right time though like if you're getting ready for this difficult conversation mm -hmm. you notice that let's say for example an employee is under stress um how do you find that right time the, the conversation is important Mm -hmm. but it might not be the right time. Like, how, how do you manage that then? Well, it, I would say it starts with the preparation. If you have a message you want to get across, then what you see a lot of people prepare the content. So what do they want to get across? But they rarely prepare, for instance, what you're saying is focusing on the procedure. Is this the right time? Um, should I have the conversation right now? Or am I that stressed myself because of my next meeting? Maybe I should postpone it to tomorrow. Or this person um, is in the middle of a project. Maybe I should postpone it until the end of the day. So making the time is also preparing the right way. Um, so that would be the content, that would be the procedure. But it would also be the interaction, like, how am I going to get this specific message across for this specific person or for this specific team? Do I write an email 
which might be sufficient sometimes um, if you mm. don't have a lot of time. I'm a big fan of face-to-face -face communication or if it has to be online, of course, but it means that you prepare what is effective for the interaction. And if you do not have the time and you're very, you know, stressed or fidgeted all the time or looking at your watch the whole time because you do not have the time, it will not be an effective communication or a conversation. So I would always say focus as a leader, really focus on what would be the right time, what would be the right place and what would be the right content and interaction. That's okay. Great. No, that, I, I like that a lot. Um, you mentioned also that you like face to face, mm -hmm. right? And we, I think we know, we also, um, from speaking to our, our mutual friend, Joe Navarro as well, mm -hmm. that these nonverbal communication plays a massive role. Yes. However, I think today there's so much that's done virtually. Yeah. Right. Uh, for, for example, I can say for myself, 99% of my communication is virtual, right? So are there any tips and tricks that, that you have for um, how to, to see these, not this nonverbal communication and how we can better create a more comfortable conversation in, in a virtual world? Yeah. Perfect question, because I think it's even more important to pick up on those signals in a virtual world. So, for instance, when when you're looking at the camera like this, it's, it's very important. But what you see sometimes is that people, you know, look away or they look that way or that way or they're distracted and then they cannot pick up on the signals. So one of the ideas would be to, for instance, hide yourself you so you can just look at the person in front of you like, you know you and I are yeah. doing right now. Um, and if you're in a team meeting where there are multiple people, it's really distracting sometimes because what you see, there's a lot of movement going on. And we have to understand that our brain picks up on movement. It's the orientation reflex. So it's constantly kind of scanning for what's going on. If I move my hands like this, you will pick up on it unconsciously or Maybe you're so focused on nonverbals that it's already very uh, consciously. Um, but that means that even in a conversation with somebody speaking and other people are moving, we will pick up on those signals instead of only looking at the person who's speaking. So we have to be aware that one, that it is exhausting, but also that it get, can give us signals. So if somebody's, you know, doing this all the time or, you know, touching the commissures here, we we have to understand that might be signals or is there discomfort going on um, with, uh, with online meetings? It's even more important to look at nonverbals because you have to pick up on the details even more. In a room, you can see people quicker um, how they're interacting with each other. And here it's just you and I in our own setting. No, I, I got you. I, I know that um, Joe spoke about that as as well, especially also like don't stay completely still. Yeah, like <laughs> this. Yeah. Also, yeah. So also one one tip. So if you're watching, like don't stay still in your in your Zoom yeah. calls. Um, great. But uh, maybe let's also dig deeper into this topic of, mm -hmm. of conflict and of difficult mm -hmm. conversations. I think conflict and um, these hard conversations are, you're just going to have them inside of an organization. Yes. You don't bring thousands and thousands of, of people together and not have some sort of conflict that would really be... Um, that would be an ideal world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Yes, one day, um, yeah. So how how should you approach like this conflict resolution, um, taking into account factors like diversity and inclusion? There, there's mm -hmm. so many things that, that leaders have to pick up on nowadays, mm -hmm. right? How can someone make sure that they're covering all the bases if they have to have a difficult conversation with someone? I think it starts with being aware again. And this is... What I said before, if you're having a difficult conversation and, and you're not preparing this, you if you're winging it, so to say, 
mm-hmm. you might be lucky sometimes that you're you're understanding this person or you already know this person very well you have a, a level of comfort already sometimes it 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 might happen the right way but if we understand that there are so many different people and so many different conflicts or conversations going on it has to do again with being alert who is this person in front of me and what i always say is know your role know your goal because mm-hmm. what is your role in that moment in that conversation with that specific person and that means that you have to at least it's my opinion if you're a good leader that you will understand this is not just about me as a leader conveying something i need to make sure that I know who the other person is and that I taking the, the time or the preparation or the, the at least the effort to understand who this person is, to ask questions, to l- look for what they need, and then we can have a better conversation. So especially when you talk about diversity of in, or inclusion, you have to be aware of your own bias during the conversation, but also beforehand. Like, what do I think is going to happen? A lot of people prepare in their mind or they're probably going to say this or they're probably going to say that, which is a good thing to do in a way because, of course, you want to prepare yourself. But make sure that you also give allowance for, um, well, turn yielding and the other and, and seeing how the other person responds and what they need and and be open for that. And that is very important, especially in big organizations, because then sometimes you see these rules happening. Like, oh, this is how we do it. Stick to the script. I would not always advise to do that. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's great advice. I, I, I have one, maybe it's also a personal one. What, what about for introverted leaders? So a lot of times I think you have leaders who may have the strength that they're very empathetic Mm -hmm. but they avoid conflict as much as they can yes in such a situation if 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 you have a leader who's like that who's supportive who's empathetic they they do a lot of the right things but when it's time for that conflict resolution it's really challenging for them what you have any tips for how someone could be able to get over that yeah, thank you. Because you, you experienced that yourself, if I may be so blunt in asking yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking yeah. for a friend, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're asking for a friend. Well, yeah. well, if your friend has this situation, first, let me let me try to, to say something that a lot of people sometimes mix up, that please know that extroverts are having trouble with interacting in conflicts as well. So it's not, you know, you look at behavior and, oh, this person is out there and they just go for it. No, I work with a lot of people that are, even in the businesses where you think there's, they're so bold and so um, self-assured, they will have no problems with difficult conversations. They do. So that would be the first reassurance. It's, I'm very fortunate that I'm very busy. Uh, with helping people to either prepare for those difficult conversations or being present at the difficult conversations, but it's not. It's it's also. Well, how can we say this? It's it's a challenge for a lot of people. So it's also um, uh, you're not alone, or your friend is not alone. So just say that. <laughs> but no, no. the the thing is, what what it's it's also to understand why you should have to have these conversations because it's okay sometimes to not have a conversation. You don't have to address everything all the time, you know, being a nitpicking person. Um, So also give yourself some allowance if you, if you dread to have some conversations sometimes, but here's the thing, if you wait too long, and this is what happens all the time with people, the, Either the behavior of the other person that you want to address continues, so the conflict might grow, and that's not what we want. So the the, the addressing of the feedback becomes harder, but also the hurdle, so to say, to do it gets harder because now yeah. it's not just a yeah. tiny thing anymore. Oops, now I really have to have a difficult conversation. So the tip would be to do it as soon as possible um, in a, in a setting where you feel comfortable, create comfort for yourself 
and of course preferably also for this other person but try to it's almost nudging yourself to do it because when you're doing it more and more often you see that if you do it early and if you do it with comfort and if you do it with compassion and empathy as you already said you have which is perfect for those conversations then you see that it it becomes less difficult because it's it's almost a muscle like you have to train this i mean this is my job and sometimes it's still difficult for me to have difficult conversations it's we don't like to have those conversations but we have to because if you don't um well the conflict might grow and that could be devastating for your team as a leader or even your company so just do it would be the summary would be summarizing. just just do it <laughs> just do it yeah no i don't i don't mean to uh, belittle you or anybody in any way because it is hard no. but what 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 is harder if you don't do it because then yeah. um it starts to simmer in your organization and especially and this is this is also difficult maybe but when you experience yourself and i i would like to know that you mm -hmm. also set an example as a leader so if yes. you don't address things others yeah. might feel oh he's not addressing it maybe i shouldn't say anything myself because if he doesn't do yeah. it maybe i shouldn't do that but how does that work for you if i may ask i think in business settings i don't i don't really have that um challenge Mm -hmm. like that that's something that I can do no problem, mm -hmm. right? So the, I think that if it needs to be done, it it gets done. But right. I, I think you you said something that is also I'm very mindful of, and that is making sure not to nitpick. So yeah. really picking out the things that you really do need to talk about, yeah. Versus trying to pick at every little thing, right? Which ends up coming across at least for if it's with your employees that is it comes across as like micromanaging to some yeah. extent yeah right and um i think sometimes these things kind of play themselves out and i think it's just you need to judge the situation yes um and coming back to, to what you said i think that actually goes even broader like on an organizational level because mm -hmm. you have also difficult conversations and need to be had with an organization. And a lot of times you see companies not addressing these things transparently, proactively with their employee base. And this many times then really has a, such a negative effect on the culture of that organization. So I don't know if you also have some examples. Um, you've, you've been doing this for, for so long now that uh, of how good transparent open communication in difficult times has helped and also how uh, the the not so good <laughs> examples they're not well. so good there's so, there well i have to choose an example well what comes to mind was a team that was working together effectively as they thought that wasn't the case so this is int this was intriguing to me because the long story short i was hired to observe the team with with their uh, they agreed with it of course yeah. and there was a lot of nonverbal communication going on that wasn't addressed at all so okay. eye rolling when somebody said something like oh that that's there he goes again or um you know kind of gossiping a little bit at least that's how it looked like you know, people saying something towards each other in a meeting so I was confused because no, that you felt it. There was almost this atmosphere that that people, oh, we're we're no, we're great together. We're working fantastically fine. But you you could pick up, or I could pick up on the signals, and then I addressed that, like, hey, but every time this person speaks, you guys cut him off, or oh, if she speaks, uh, you guys start to talk with each other. So what is going on? And all of a sudden, it was kind of like a wake up call for all of them. Like, oh, we are showing behavior that is not transparent and, um, well, it was transparent on the negative part, but not transparent on what they were experiencing with each other. Yes. So by kind of opening that up and asking them, hey, so why do I see this behavior? 
And this is hard. And of course, I work with safety to, to create a good atmosphere that they will open up on it. But what happened afterwards is that they actually started to talk about what um, what they were feeling, what they were experiencing, but also about situations that had happened two years ago and that was still, because they, they never talked about it, that was still there, you know? So there was still this residue of negative situations, but because it never was addressed, um, it was still simmering there. Long story short, by opening up, by clearing the air, by discussing everything, you all of a sudden, everybody was like, oh, they were breathing in a different way. Uh, they were more happy. And the fun part is, fun part, I would say the great effective part was that they started interacting with each other more directly, more interactive, uh, uh, directly going to the person that they needed to go. And that meant that things were faster, that the team were, was more effective. And that had a great result on the business um, part of things. So yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely something that um, will always be interesting is this this mix of of people um, and what does it really mean to be like a high performing team, right? Yes, because again, there it, it becomes even more difficult if you have just a leader mm -hmm. and who has to have self awareness, but that's like 10 X. Now you're going into a large group of people who need to have that same self-awareness of themselves and of, of the group as well. Maybe let's, let's uh, shift over to, because I know we have, we talked a lot about what people can do. Um, but what about some of, what are some of the common pitfalls that you find leaders encountering when they have to go into these difficult conversations? Many pitfalls. Um, first, not having the conversation, that would be number one. Also not preparing the right way, uh, just focusing on content and not on procedure and interaction, but also being really focused on themselves. I have a message mm. for you. You have to listen to me. Um, this is important for you to know. And that means that they as talked before, that they don't take the other person into consideration. And if you want to, I would always say, like, if you want to make sure that a, that a message gets to the person, you don't just deliver it. Here it is. Have fun with it. You, may, you have to make sure that it's, that's a message that you can give to this other person and that they can kind of unwrap it and, and fully understand what it means and respond to it and understand what it means for them. What are the consequences? What is the message mm -hmm. that, um, so it's important that leaders know that sometimes I would say that they have to know that they have a more important role than they think they have when it comes mm -hmm. to difficult conversations. Um, because it, it has, it can have effects for years, even if people are fired the wrong way or, if um, somebody gets feedback on a project, I recently worked with a woman. She's she's a manager herself, but she ha mm -hmm. got some feedback, and the feedback was given to her poorly and in an unprofessional way. And mm -hmm. the effect was that she, as a leader, became very timid and afraid to step up to be proactive because she was afraid. Oh, if I'm going to do something now you know, they will bite my head off. Um, yeah, yeah. The thing is, she needed to be helped to have a difficult conversation about that as well. Because even if you experienced a difficult conversation, an ineffective one, it's also your duty to have a conversation about that conversation. And, yeah. and that, that doesn't happen either. So if you are very rude to me, yeah. Usually what people say is like, okay, bye. And they're not going to talk to you anymore, or they just gossip about it. But actually saying, Brian, I really want to listen to what you have to say, but you, you're the way you shout at me or the way you're looking at your phone now doesn't give me the, the confidence that you really want to help me grow 
as a person, you know, of those kind of things? Or could you be so kind in really focusing on me and um, expressing what I need to change instead of me telling you that you don't like my behavior? What is it specifically that I need yeah. to change, for instance? So yeah. being specific and also talk about the conversation is important. Great. No, that's, uh, I, I really like that a lot. I think that's, that's something that um, you can basically immediately implement. Um, I guess my, my next question is, as we look to start wrapping up, um, looking at leadership teams, right? So let's, let's look at C-levels. A lot of times you have situations where I don't know, you may have like mass layoffs or really difficult situations within uh -huh. a large organization. How can leaders better prepare themselves? Like how should they behave to be able to keep that organization um, as calm as possible to make and transport that, that message to everyone? Because I think it's one thing when they're having a one-to-one -one conversation. Yeah, true where it's like, okay, it's just me and you, we're both comfortable, but what what is it like for a CEO when he has to deliver like bad news to potentially thousands of people or so or hundreds yeah. of people? What what would that look like? How would you prepare someone for a situation like that? Well, the same principles apply. Um, mm -hmm. And I this reminds me of a situation where... Uh, with BNP, the leader, there was this huge oil spill and yeah. it was a massive disaster. And his response was very focused on the eye. I am so, I can't sleep anymore. This is so awful for me and that I have to do this. Um, the same principles apply that you, yes, you have to have to deliver a difficult content, but you have to understand that it is not about you. It is about, of course, you have to be comfortable to stand in front of a camera or to to say something towards your your colleagues or your peers in this case. But you have to understand that you have to show empathy, that you have to help. So, for instance, lowering your voice to create calm is a very effective way to really show people that this is a serious message and that it's difficult news or, or, or a bad situation for them. So you have to understand that the interaction for you as a CEO needs to show that it is a difficult conversation and that you're not just reading it from a paper or that you faking the empathy because that, that is what you see sometimes. And I would say if you have to deliver the message in a, in a big group, make sure that you address the group as a group. So you, for instance, I, I work with somebody who, who had to do this in a big hall, so to say. And that means that you really have to look at everybody and address them and show them in your voice and in your gestures that you're devastated. Because what happens is he was really hurt that they ha had to deliver the message. But because he, need, he needed to go in performance mode uh, with the preparations, he almost, you know, the face got still, as Joe talked about, we saw the stress in his face, and that came across as less empathetic. So okay. although it sounds a bit weird for some people that you rehearse those kind of talks, it's essential because it's not, oh, I want to look good. No, you know you want to have a message that is or you know you have a message that, uh, that is affecting a lot of people and you want to make sure that you do this with care and that you're a leader that shows that you care because you really did care but because yeah. of stress it is difficult to show sometimes because they're so focused on oh i have to get this right um so yeah same principle goes content prepare yes Procedure, prepare it. When are you going to talk about this? And also, what are you going to do with your interaction? Yeah, so making making that preparation key, getting yourself centered. Like uh, I think those are those sound like really really good advice because one can only imagine how much stress that you're under in in situations like that. Yeah, 
right? Yeah. So having that is key. That that BP example we we know quite well. We we talked about it on on our po- podcast before. Um, and uh, empathy, I think, was also like this big foundational key for that. Yes. And so that's that's what what we also found as well. So super. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And when you have empathy, like you said, if you yourself is a person that has empathy, it's a great quality because a lot of I'm not saying that leaders don't have empathy. But they don't show a lot of empathy sometimes because they're so busy yeah. or they're focused on the goal. And it's the key element, I would say, to effective leadership when it comes to the soft skills, of course, because that is my uh, job to focus on the soft skills of uh, of behavior. Sure, sure. Cool. Cool. I mean, so I guess the last question um, from my side would be, what are some of the um, non-verbals? So really this behavior that a leader should look for in his team, because Mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier, it's hard to tell like, okay, is my team performing well? Mm -hmm. Is everyone really happy? Are are they in a place where they can do their best work because Mm -hmm. of exactly um, what we mentioned earlier, someone is not being fully truthful with you everything's okay everything is perfect everything's all good what are some of the the keys uh, behavioral keys that that we can look for as leaders to be able to better observe and and better validate the the situation within our teams Mm -hmm. good question because there's so many and now i have to choose again i would (laughs) for me one of the elements that is that is the furrowed glabella when people are Mm -hmm. listening to you like this it's being recorded so you see this part and that might be an indication of either being critical towards what you're saying or Mm -hmm. critical to other people like oh what are they saying eye rolling is an indication of that they're if you pick up on a lot of eye rolling, there's something going on in the team that is not uh, really open and that they're not really open with feedback and all those kind of things. Um, But I also think that when you look at how quickly people are speaking, how loud people are speaking, that, that can also be indications of, is this a safe area for everyone to speak up? Or is this, or is there always this one person that shouts out their ideas is very loud and, and other people are a bit more timid saying it like that. So you you can look at that as well, the, the variety of how people address things um, and, and connect it with that. How much space does everybody take up or is everybody uh, getting sp- space to vent or space to have ideas? Because it's not, it doesn't mean that everybody has to have the same amount of time always, but uh, what I see when people work very effectively in a team, there's room for everybody to say something. And some people might speak a bit more than others, but you, if you're quiet the whole time and they don't check, hey, is there something that you have to add? That could, that could be an indication of, hey, is this team working effectively enough? I would say, but there are many, many more, but then we have to have another hour. No, I, I think... Um can totally appreciate that but then it's a great opportunity um, for you to let people know where they can find out more about you um, and be able to learn more of these um, behavioral analysis skills sure well i'm always excited when people uh, connect on linkedin so that would be my name on linkedin uh, but they also can send an email to amo at a behavior company dot eu behavior spelled the British way. But um, you can also find me with information on YouTube or uh, there's a video of Wired. So there's information out there. But if somebody has questions, please feel free to connect. It's always nice to know what people are up to or what is, you know, happening in their businesses and what, um, what, what, what are they striving for? What are the troubles when it comes to behavior? So, uh, would be great if they uh, connect with me and send me emails or on LinkedIn. Super, super. Yeah, we'll, we'll be sure to link everything in the show notes, um, all your contact info, et cetera. 
And thank you, thank you so much, Anne, for joining us today and um, having hopefully what was not a difficult conversation. Not um, at all. <laughs> And well, for everyone listening and watching, thank you so much for joining yet another episode of the Aspire to Inspire podcast. Please feel free, tell your friends, tell your coworkers to give this a listen. We're here to help communicators and we'll see you next time. 